All right, sounds like I get to start. Um, Lind, welcome everyone from Denver Startup Week. Welcome, Linda Rotenberg. Uh, Linda, you're such an amazing businesswoman. You're a great friend. Um, you're in the Endeavor co-founder and CEO. You promote global entrepreneurship, VC evangelist, my favorite, Chica Loca, and the mom <laughs> of twins. <laughs> so, you know, I loved your book. You, you actually gave me a hand-signed copy years ago of uh, Crazy as a Compliment, The Power of Zigging When Everyone Else Sags. And today we get to talk about one of your most amazing zigs. You are an... <laughs> You are an early visionary, understanding the importance of supporting entrepreneurs in underserved markets. Endeavor has a long track record. Can you tell us your thesis for launching Endeavor in 1997 and how Endeavor was one of the first entrepreneur support organizations in the countries where you launched? Well, first of all, it's so great to be here. My only regret is that I can't be all with all of you in person. Uh, I got to know Sandy for almost seven years on the Zale board and relished my trips back to Denver and Boulder. So I hope to be back in person soon, but this is the next best thing. Um, so yeah, my, uh, my crazy journey, I guess, began in the, in the mid nineties. And I had graduated from Harvard and Yale Law School, had no interest in practicing law, went and did a number of projects in Latin America and realized no one was starting businesses. And it was the moment when in this country we had Yahoo and Netscape and Steve Jobs coming back to Apple. And I didn't understand why no one was starting companies. And two things happened. First, I would tell the story of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak starting Apple, you know, a computer in, in, in the Jobs' garage, the famous story. And, and people looked at me like I was from outer space. And one day a kid from Brazil walked up and he said, Linda, that's a nice story, but how does it relate to my life? I don't even have a garage. <laughs> and so that was the first aha moment. There's no role models that resonate. And then my taxi driver had an engineering degree and I didn't understand why he was driving a cab. And I tried to ask him why he wasn't an entrepreneur and I couldn't think of the word. And it turns out there wasn't even a word, a popular word in Spanish or Portuguese. And we found this true in, there wasn't a word for entrepreneur in Arabic or Turkish or Bahasa Indonesian. I was just with the Greek prime minister who said, we don't even have one in, in, in Greek. So it never really set out to identify the highest growth, what we call high impact entrepreneurs from any walk of life, but who had big ideas and big ambitions and connect them with the resources, the capital, the mentorship, the networks they needed to succeed, and then tell their stories so that others could say, okay, if he can do it, if she can do it, I can too. So uh, we can talk about where Endeavor is today. It's been a tw in fascinating 25 year journey, but the basic premise at the beginning is you need role models to be able to say, hey, this is a possible you know, path for me. It, it's been a long time since 1997, right? That's the way back. But what role did Endeavor really play in the first 10 years? Yeah, well, look, I think now it's so funny. You mentioned Chica Loca. I was considered the crazy <laughs> girl for assuming there were entrepreneurs in these markets and then suggesting people could invest in them. And then, uh, you know, later on, we, we started our own fund, which we'll talk about later. Um, but what I would say looking back is that Endeavor really seeded these ecosystems, right? And when we look back now, so if you look outside the United States and China, 24% of the rest of the world's unicorns, the billion dollar plus companies that we start hearing about, the, the tech unicorns, come from these emerging markets that Endeavor is in. In 12 countries, the first unicorn is an Endeavor company. In 14 of these markets, two thirds of the first three or four unicorns, if they have those, are Endeavor. Wow. But more importantly, it's not only that we found the most successful companies, but we turned founders into funders so that we could get the circle going with angel investment. We had people tell their stories back to the role model effect. 
So the last story I'll tell is one of our very first entrepreneurs was a kid named Wences Casares, grew up on a sheep farm in Patagonia, was turned down by 34 investors, basically all the investors in Buenos Aires at the time for his E-Trade of Latin America. They didn't understand what E-Trade was. This is 1998. Endeavor comes in. We think he's genius. He's 24, but got such big ambitions. We select him as an Endeavor entrepreneur. We help him recruit his, his executive team. We help him raise his first $4 million of, of, of capital from Fred Wilson, who was then at Flatiron Partners. He's, he's now at um, Union Square Ventures. And I joke that Wentz has got the full service endeavor because he married my assistant. <laughs> uh, but 18 months later, Wentz has sold, and this is, remember, this is 1999, right? Wences sells Patagon.com, this company, to Banco Santander for $750 million. And to this day, wow. people will say, if Wences can do it, I can too. So I think that beyond seeding these unicorns and showing that it's possible to invest, sharing the stories of people who didn't come from the top 10 families, who didn't look like the traditional business leaders, I think that's really the role that Endeavor has played. That is amazing. I want to circle back to something you said earlier. Um, you said Endeavor supports high impact entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what high impact means to you? Sure. Um, look, for us, high impact starts with growth. We've always been about high growth companies. We believe you can't create jobs, you can't change industries, you can't innovate, and you can't achieve any social goals unless you grow, right? And that is just a belief. So we're not about lifestyle businesses. We're not about micro businesses. We're not about mom and pops. We really are about the, the fastest growing companies. But within that, for us, high impact, we also believe that it's not only about, you know, making the most um, returns, that how you operate in many of these countries, our entrepreneurs are the first in the country to give stock option plans to the employees. We spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs on culture in their businesses, how you treat your employees, how you treat your customers with net promoter score, which you know very well, um, is really important and not always common in these markets. And then the last thing is, look, I think that things like ESG and 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 we've had a lot have a lot of companies in fintech and health tech and ed tech and ag tech, but even for the traditional SaaS and software companies, the idea of ESG goals, environment, social governance, these used to be peripheral goals, right? Mm -hmm. Only, and we would, we honestly said, we're not impact investors, we're, you know, high impact. <laughs> but today, <laughs> any company that wants to grow, we have so many companies going public now or spacking. you must have at the center ESG goals. I was called yesterday for um, one of the companies I'm on the board of. It happens to be one of our Argentine companies that went public on the New York Stock Exchange. I was called in by a large investor to talk about ESG goals. So I would say there's this merging of high growth and high impact in terms of these, these other you know, non-financial aspects. That was crystal clear on what impact means now. So I'm not even sure I was 100% clear until you just described it. So thank you so much. So you have a front row seat on emerging markets. What trends are you seeing in emerging markets around the world? Well, it's been extraordinary, Sandy. And, you know, literally people used to say, there will never be entrepreneurs in emerging markets or they'll never get money. And now I get called up by, you know, all of the Silicon Valley venture funds saying, hey, who's your next Endeavor company, right? <laughs> and, and the amount of capital going into these markets is, is extraordinary. And as I mentioned, the number of unicorns, I think the first well, unicorns, the billion dollar tech companies that Aileen Lee um, coined, it was in 2014. And it was so rare, right? And now it seems like they're minted a lot, but it was really only the US, China, maybe Israel, very few countries. And now the acceleration of companies that are gaining capital, that are growing, that are creating massive innovations on a regional and global level is so much more diversified. And I think in terms of solving real world problems like financial inclusion and health tech and edtech, I think we're gonna start seeing things originate in these emerging markets and actually being copycatted here rather than the way we've seen it backwards all around. 
But the last thing I'll say, and I think this is important for a place like Denver too, is that one of the, the one of the rationales of starting Endeavor was to create well, the PayPal mafia. Reed Hoffman's on my board. He's part of the original PayPal mafia. He doesn't like it. He's like, can we say network? I'm like, no, 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 own the mafia. <laughs> my Italian board members aren't so thrilled, but anyway, we own the mafias. <laughs> there were none, right? Right. And so all of these new tech, tech startups or tech enabled companies were creating the executives, creating the talent, the engineers from the ground up. What's super exciting is, in the Middle East, one of our companies, Kareem, sold to Uber for $3 billion. It's, it was the biggest exit. Now we're seeing ex-Kareem top employees founding the next generation of companies. This is come, happening in, in Latin America as well with companies like Rappi, which is the Instacart of, you know, of, 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 of Latin America and a lot of um, the e-commerce, te the tech enablement. So what's exciting is seeing the next generation where founders have the experience and now can really uh, get to get to growth even faster. And I think that's what we're seeing in Denver as well. Amazing. Now, in the news, I'm hearing a lot of top funders talking about the opportunity in international markets, including SoftBank, Y Combinator. Why did this change and why are we hearing from them now? Yeah, they're a little late to the game, right? <laughs> Softbank, by the way, Softbank says that over 75% of their investments in Latin America are in Endeavor companies. Um, and actually, it's it's kind of cool. We now have a fund. We have the nonprofit that seeds the local ecosystems, and then we have Endeavor Catalyst, which is our side-by-side -side funds that we um, that we have and in a rules-based entrepreneur first way. We are always about being entrepreneur first. But if you look at the firms that invest in the most companies outside the US and China that become these you know billion dollar plus value companies. That SoftBank is number one, then Tiger, Sequoia, and then Endeavor Catalyst. And we get in earlier, right? So we knew mm -hmm. beforehand, I think that, look, I think there's always been talent. I think what's exciting is that there are really strong local investors now that are seeding the early stage, the seed and series A's that we hadn't seen 10 years ago. So the maturation of these ecosystems is happening. What I hope is that these players stay. I think that when we look at what happened in India, you know, Silicon Valley came into India in, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, and then a number of them pulled out after it was difficult. So I will say that I'm that I think some of these players are there for the long term, but I'm I'm a little skeptical that if downturns happen, look, emerging markets are volatile. Some of them are gonna are, are, are gonna pull out, and so I think that for you know Endeavor, we always say, look, we're about trust and we're about being entrepreneur first, and then ideally more and more local funders will crop up that are sophisticated because we know that those are staying. So that's my. But it's That's, interesting times. <laughs> it is. And those are such important pillars to establish, right? Being trusted by, by the folks who you're investing in. It's amazing. So I'm going to transition the discussion a little bit and talk about the U.S. Yeah. So <laughs> and Endeavor's role in the U.S. and specifically Endeavor's role in supporting underrepresented founders. I'm going to break it down into a couple questions so you don't have to answer it all at once. <laughs> um, when did Endeavor first launch in the United States? Well, we were just talking about this yesterday at my board meeting because it's the 10 year kind of anniversary of these conversations. So first of all, I was just in Greece last week um, and uh, and I was reminded that in 2011, we'd been pulled in by Greece. Actually, the, the current prime minister, Kyriakos Mitsotakis, is a close friend of mine from college and he and his wife, he had been a venture capitalist and she was as well. And they said, we need Endeavor in Greece. This was in 2011. And, <laughs> And I went on CNBC on Squawk Box and Andrew Ross Sorkin says, Linda, if you're going to start Endeavor in Europe, why in God's name would you choose Greece? <laughs> and so I said, well, when economies turn down, <laughs> entrepreneurs turn up. OK, so I said this and I knew that was going to kind of open the floodgates. So we started getting calls from Spain and Italy and Europe. And, I, and then the folks from Miami called and they said, you know what? why aren't we in the united states why is endeavor only in now these emerging markets and now europe so it's it's you know uh, maybe the re-emerging markets but we need help here this was after the the great recession 
jobs were being hemorrhaged and what convinced the board and me I, I was at first skeptical i was like we don't need endeavor they have role models we know what a garage is <laughs> I mean, what's the problem people but but people said look you can start companies in miami atlanta louisville denver but you're told if you want to get the next round if you want to get to the series b you have to move to one of the coasts oh well that doesn't sound mm -hmm. right and so they said, we want to build, we want to keep our families here. We want to build jobs here. We want to build world-class companies from these secondary cities. Why should we have to, you know, move? And so it seemed similar enough. So when Endeavor started, it really was about underserved geographies, right? In these secondary cities. I think in addition, as an additional layer, we've sort of said, okay, now in addition, you've got to look at these underrepresented you know, founders as well. So it's a combination of underserved geographies and underrepresented founders. Yeah, and, and just to drive that point home, how do you see Endeavor's role in the U.S. as similar or different from the roles in emerging markets? Well, we've tried to make it, we have the this one Endeavor value. And so it's hard, I'll be honest. I, I mean, I say sometimes it feels like we're playing two different games, right? But I think what's very important to me is to align them both. And so one of the things is finding entrepreneurs that are not only at that scale up phase, but that want global connectivity. So it's been wonderful seeing companies from Colorado, whether it's, you know, Sondermind or Everside Health or Quantum Metric or Jump Cloud or Work at Health, right? Or uh, that, that really want that global connectivity. And it's been really amazing to see these connections, you know, happening. Um, and so that's really important. And, and, and I'll, I'll come, remind me to come back to a story, my favorite new, uh, uh, happening right now, uh, connection between Africa and Denver, uh, Endeavor, Endeavor right now. Um, but I think that that's important. And then we want to make sure that they're really going to have ecosystem impact. So I think there is this extra filter in the US of, look, how are you going to cut through the noise? Because there are lots of you know, successful companies here. What is it that you're doing either on the innovation side or because you're putting a secondary city on the map or because you're an underrepresented founder, 35% of the Endeavor companies in the US have a non-white founder. 19% uh, are led by women. So I think that, which we need to improve, but compared to the VC, which is about 1%, we're doing pretty well. So I think that that's the extra. So we have the same calibration, it's just a different filter of what it means to have impact, right? Versus in Vietnam, just to be a successful company, you know, is, is something that is putting that whole country on the map. So what does it mean if, if, if you're coming from a state? Yeah, and back to the word impact, right? It's, it's about that impact. So Endeavor often supports later stage startups that already have VC investment. I'm gonna use some stats that Linda, I know you know like the back of your hand, but our audience might be surprised by. Uh, in the US, less than 2% of venture-backed companies have women founders. Mm -hmm. Only 58 Latinx women have ever raised, ever, over 1 million in venture capital funding. And just 0.3% of venture dollars go to Black women founders. So how does Endeavor's mission to support underserved markets translate into its work supporting underrepresented founders in U.S. offices who are often overlooked similar to those entrepreneurs in emerging markets. Well, look, I mean, what's exciting about the Endeavor companies is, as I said, they have to have that extra filter. Like there are a lot of people, thank God, there are a lot of people now playing in that space of underrepresented founders. That's not enough for us because I, I use this phrase, if not for Endeavor, like I don't want to be duplicative, right? If not mm -hmm. for Endeavor. They can, and so for us, as I said, they have to have that global connectivity piece, no matter what gender they are, what color their skin is, if they don't have that. So I've just been on the phone with uh, two of the top, top black tech founders from Squire Technologies. They are doing a SaaS integrated platform for all the barber shops in, in the US. Um, and they will, they will, they are, they are Sunicorn. <laughs> Soon to be a unicorn. And they're amazing, but they want to expand, they're expanding to Canada, to Australia. They love the global connectivity. So I would say it's not enough to have a scale up and be, you know, uh, you know, an underrepresented family, you have to, whether you're, what, no matter, as I said, what your background is, you have to have that global connectivity piece. What is exciting is that, as I said, 35% of our 
uh, companies have uh, an, an, an underrepresented founder. We have several, even in, in the uh, Colorado portfolio with Work at Health, uh, founded by two women, Bill Go, co-founder is female. We have a number of candidates in the, in the market. So I think by sharing, showcasing the stories and showing that there really can be very high growth companies, um, I think that's the way Endeavor works. But I think that for us, you know, as I said, having that global aspiration, even if your core market is the US, is where we can just add that unique value. And the last thing I'll say is for all the people in Denver now, I would say this is a way to compete with the Silicon Valley folks. Even if you're not going to expand beyond the US, having that global mindset, knowing what business models are similar to yours, but what's happening in Brazil? What's happening in Indonesia? What's happening in, in Egypt or Dubai? There, what's happening in Nigeria? The more you understand what's happening in the rest of the world in your space, the, 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 the better off you're gonna be beating the competition domestically as well. Absolutely, that market understanding is hugely important. And, and real quick, I think you've been completely clear on this, but I wanna make sure the audience doesn't miss it. To clarify, does in Denver only work with underrepresented entrepreneurs in the U.S.? No, not only. Um, we as we believe in that uh, pay it forward uh, role model effect, as we were talking about. So whether you and when you look at you know Sondermind and Quantum Metric and Everside Health, these are white founders, white male founders. But first of all, they're coming from Denver. They want to put Colorado on the map. Similarly, we have companies in you know. <laughs> across uh, secondary cities. But more than that, they want to engage. They want uh, companies that are off the coast to engage, as I said, with the world as well. And, and when you look at, look at, you know, Eversight, when you were health tech, when you look at Sondermine that's doing with mental health, we feel like get, having real solutions to the major problems is important. We're going to be supportive. So we have an extra lens to say, hey, and if you have a, an underrepresented founder, great. But no, mm -hmm. we, are, we are open to anyone. No, that, that's great. Now, one last question before we go to Q&A. So everyone get your, get your questions ready because this is a one shot, well, not a one shot. This is a <laughs> unique opportunity at asking Linda questions. Okay, last question. What can we expect to see from Endeavor Colorado and other US markets in the next 10 years? So looking forward. Look, I think that, um, not that I want to make us obsolete, <laughs> but but I do hope that the I, I I do hope that people no longer have a question that look if I'm if I if I am based in Denver if I'm based in Atlanta or Detroit or Miami or wherever they may be that it's impossible for me to scale up a company. Why I, I don't want that ever to cross anyone's mind, which it did up until a few years ago. That's beat one. And the same with people who are not boy, white boys in hoodies living in Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> so I think that I want people to believe in that they can be an entrepreneur. It's about the quality of the idea, the innovation and the execution, but it shouldn't matter geographically where you're based or demographically who you are. And you should be able to access the same networks and mentorship and capital to be able to, to have you thrive. That's, that's my goal. And, and just knowing that is such a big difference in someone. I am a Latina. I'm a Chica Loca, just like you. And uh, just knowing that those options are out there and available is huge. So thank you so much, Linda. So now I'm going to go back to the audience and see if anyone has any questions. I don't see anything written in here yet, um, but I could be missing something. Any questions from the audience? If not, I'm going to have to ask Linda some other questions. All right, Linda, what was your best moment as you started to build out these boards kind of across the country and across the world, can you remember the, the moment you're most proud of? Well, let me talk. Well, first of all, let me answer that in two ways. And I'm going to come back to my story. One <laughs> is when early on, about five years into Endeavor, I mentioned that the taxi moment and there was no word. The editor of the Portuguese Brazilian Dictionary called up our team and said, in part because of Endeavor's work, they were adding the words emprendedor and emprendedorismo into the lexicon. So entrepreneur and entrepreneurship exist. That was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, 
I, I think that looks so many of our entrepreneurs have not only, you know, gone public or may been successful, but they're joining our boards. They're paying it forward. And that to me on a daily basis is what gives me most joy. But back to the conversation we were having earlier, I love, especially since the US people were questioning, does, just as you asked, is this different? Will they connect? So I love when there are these connections. So the story that's happening right now is that one of our top uh, board members in uh, in Africa, she's Kenyan, uh, Sylvia Mulinge, who's one of the top telecom uh, executives, right? <laughs> so I connected her with Dan Caruso and yeah, getting my ex, uh, my old Zayo hat back on. But <laughs> Sylvia Mulinge, who's incredible, m happens to mention we're in backstage in a Zoom like this, and she happens to mention, do I know Eric Rosa because uh she had read an, an hbs case study on crossfit and wanted to bring it to uh to africa to kenya and i said do i know eric Rosa? oh yeah so i connected them <laughs> so she is bringing crossfit to east africa okay and she and our managing director from endeavor it's kenya crazy. are coming to visit the endeavor colorado board you will probably meet sylvia and and fiona in sometime in the coming weeks so i thought that that's what i love Right when there are these cross cultural connections and it's the same energy and the same spirit that to me, those are my favorite moments. Oh my gosh, and Eric is amazing. He gives back in so many ways. All right, we have a question from Tara Friedman. Uh, as you think about the portfolio that Endeavor manages, how are you supporting these organizations in their growth from a consistent perspective, i.e. technology infrastructure, accounting management, et cetera? Thank you, Tara. <laughs> well, first of all, um, that's a great question. So we we support entrepreneurs in multiple ways. So number one, they will get a local account manager. Anybody who's selected, and we have offices now in forty markets. We have five hundred full time Endeavor employees around the world. Uh, we have boards in in all of these you know countries or, or, or cities. So that's that's beat one is they'll have a geographic set of people that are looking out for them. We also at Endeavor Global, which is our New York and California headquarters, um, have verticals. So we have a vertical manager. So if you're in the health tech space or the fintech space or the software as a service space or wherever you fall, your F and B, you're going to have your vertical account manager because there are some issues that are cross cutting based on your your industry. The, the third piece is the access to capital team. So if you're raising your series A or your series B or your series C or you're thinking of spacking or going public, we're going to get people who can help you gain access to the right in, you know, investors and will co-invest um, uh, if, um, if, if you raise a qualified round. And then the last piece is um, a few years ago, we realized that our fastest growing companies, we call Endeavor Outliers, had a whole series of, of, of different questions that were about what if I have board conflicts? What if my role needs to change? What if my co-founder's role needs to change? You know, what if things aren't going so well and I don't know who to chose? Or do I go public? Is this the right time? I'm sort of <laughs> waiting and my, my, my investors want it or don't want it. And so we said, you know what? All of these kind of issues that who else can you talk to? We need that peer-to-peer -peer network in that safe space. And you asked me why entrepreneurs, um, you know, choose Endeavor when they have all these uh investors now and uh, a quote came last week we had one of our newest endeavor entrepreneurs who's one of the top um logistics uh, uh company founders in in um called shipper in indonesia and he has sequoia and Y combinator whom you mentioned <laughs> on his cap table and he was asked this question and he said you know what yeah i have great investors on my cap table but at the end of the day we're looking out for our own interest Endeavor is the only entrepreneur first organization that I know will be my trusted partner. And so um, what I would say to Tara is more than accounting, more than some specific thing, it's that safe space for no, no question is off the table where you know people will have your backs. And, and for all of those of you who are starting companies, I encourage you even beyond your board to have that safe space of peers or other people who you know you can, you can tell the, the real truth, no matter how non rosy it looks. That is so unique and so valuable and, and just not even something people have ever had access to. So thank you for bringing that on. Okay, we have another question. 
How or what, in your expert opinion, are the three top points to get quality mentorship connected to investors? Um, so wait, how to get the mentorship or the investors? Um, can How to get quality mentorship connected to investors. So how do you, how do we connect mentors and investors? How do we connect mentors and investors or the entrepreneurs and the investors? Well, gosh, it says mentors, but let's go with entrepreneurs <laughs> and investors. Well, well look, with mentors, <laughs> let, let's do both. How do you get mentors okay. and how do you get investors? I'll take both Perfect. questions. We'll separate them. Perfect. So for mentors, <laughs> um, no, no, uh, no offense to my college uh, friend, Sheryl Sandberg of, 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 of Facebook, who's like, I don't want to mentor anyone. Don't come up to me and ask to be my mentor. <laughs> like, uh, you know, I actually have a saying that stalking is an underrated startup strategy. I stalk <laughs> people. <laughs> What I would say is don't stalk the obvious people. If you're stalking Reed Hoffman or Michael Dell, they're not gonna give you the time of day. But if there's someone on LinkedIn or someone you're following on, and 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 they and it's a specific reason that you have some connection and you have something specific that you wanna learn from them. I find people are actually pretty open. So that's that's one thing I would just sort of say is don't be afraid of, 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 of putting yourself you know, out there. On the investor side, um, look, I believe in a lot of, uh, there's two answers to this. Number one is I would do a lot of due diligence on the investors. I would talk to other entrepreneurs who've had investments from this firm, because I think it's one thing to have a reputation or how much their money they have. And it's another thing, when things go poorly, how does that board member respond? And I would get real feedback from other entrepreneurs. And then what I would say is if you're looking to try to get connected to investors. There's a lot of groups now even beyond, you know, Endeavor and Y Combinator. There's a lot of, um, you know, female founder groups. There's a lot of groups by vertical. I would, I would, I would put yourself out there and go, there's now a lot of support groups where you can, and there's a lot of investors that want access to great founders. So I would say, just, just keep putting yourself out there. If I haven't answered your question, that's not what you meant. You can <laughs> clarify. I heard, thank you very much. So that's, that's great. Um, you mentioned all of the support groups, and I think that that is something that has really evolved over time. Yeah. So are, do you have any favorite support groups outside of Endeavor that, that folks could participate in or that folks should learn from? Well, I think it depends. Look, I think there are a lot more women's groups now, first of all, and, and a lot more you know, female founders, founder to funder groups. Same with black founders. I think that in funders, um, some of our own entrepreneurs, you know, Brian Burkeen and his wife Candace started one of the venture companies. We've seen a dozen or so um, black founder led uh, venture firms crop up. I, I assume this is the case also on the, on the uh, Latinx side. So I think that um, new, new organizations with specializations are, are, are cropping up. I think that you know YEO and YPO are great in terms of having that support group, so having that peer forum. And if you can't be part of those, I would say that, that what's what's good about them and what I mentioned with our Endeavor Outliers program is that peer-to-peer -peer safe space. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I love the connections between some of the US entrepreneurs and global is oftentimes it's hard to have conversations with people in your you know sphere you're worried they're going to steal your engineering team if you admit any vulnerability <laughs> <laughs> so talking to someone outside of your circle whether it's in a different vertical space or a different geographic space or a different demographic space right i think in some ways find that peer group where you can be totally honest because you don't worry that they're suddenly going to be you know stealing some of your market share or your team if if, if you're vulnerable that, that's a good point. I don't have another question, but I have all sorts of them myself. So I, I've met a lot of folks who you've hired over the years. So you know, you talked about the different verticals. What? How do you hire such amazing people? Because I haven't met one that I'm like, 
Oh, wow, I want you on my team, but I know if I steal you from Linda, she says, I'm knocking on my door. <laughs> we, love that. We, we, we train a lot of people. And then after six or seven years, they go to work for Endeavor Entrepreneurs, which is great. Actually, one of my teamers, one of our companies from Spain went public yesterday on the NASDAQ wall box <laughs> in, a, in a SPAC. And one of the key people is one of my former uh, employees, team members from New York, uh, who went to work for them five years ago, which I'm so proud of, right? So it's uh, at the right moment. Sandy, it's a <laughs> look, I think that um, we have a set of core values and the number one is entrepreneur first. Mm -hmm. And and we're about, as I said, globalism. And if you're passionate mm -hmm. about those two things, if you're passionate about really being on the side of entrepreneurs and you're excited no matter which piece of endeavor you're in to, to be part of something that is global, then, then that's the infectiousness that we all want. And that means when it's COVID and we can't travel or we can't right go to the office, that that the culture still has that same sort of spirit. Um, one of the great things about the Great Resignation, and we did lose some people, right? Some millennials. I think this is happening everywhere. I think people. But what's been interesting is the people we've hired, in return, have more experience and are and have that global you know connectivity. And what I would tell everyone is. This is a great moment for us all to reassess. Um, you know that my husband is a writer and his latest book was called Life is in the Transitions. Well, we've all been through a major transition, right? And so I think both as employers and as employees, our founders, we all are board members. It's a great opportunity to say, look, how do I want to spend my time? And if I'm not doing something that I truly am excited about to wake up every day or to Zoom late at night, then maybe mm -hmm. it's time for a change. And what that means is the rest of us need to kind of recommit, right? And, and bring back this sort of energy. And so that's what's been exciting is that um, for us, we have people who bring that energy and some people stay a long time and some people go on to work with our entrepreneurs, but they're, they remain part of the ecosystem. And so that's <laughs> okay too. I love that. And life is a bunch of transition, or you're always in transition. I like to think of life as episodes. So someday, you know, there's, you know, you're in this episode. How do you transition to that next episode? Or should you yeah. stay, right? Exactly. Is it season one or season two? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And look, I've had every, Reed Hoffman, back to Reed, told me something that we should do. He said, look, every two years, you should reassess or every year, whether you still want to be CEO or you're still excited. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, my role has changed. So even though it's shocking to me that I've stayed almost 25 years in one place, but my role keeps changing. And so I, I encourage people to do that too. Sometimes when you think you want to change, you end up staying at the same place, but with mm -hmm. a new mindset. And so it's almost like it's that new tour of duty, that new, as you said, it, it's the new episode. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I love that. So we've talked about all the things that go right, but when we talk about transitions, sometimes things don't go right. Have you learned any lessons from entrepreneurs about, you know, how to recover from failure or how to prevent failure? How, how just to keep a positive attitude when things aren't going right? Well, I have. And first of all, I always say that chaos is the friend of the entrepreneur, but the reality is, is entrepreneurship is a volatile thing. You're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have some failures. It's just as part of the game. Mm -hmm. So I think that anyone who says it's all been linear up, that's, I, I, I'm, I'm a little skeptical. So I think that entrepreneurship is about these, these, these moments of transition and recovery and, and tough times. What I would, what I would say though, is, um, uh, wait, sorry. Say, say, I, I lost. <laughs> what, have, what have we learned? So, so oh, my how, lessons. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I think people focus on the wrong things. I think people focus on, you know, oh, product market fit, or oh, it's the financials, or oh, the the the, the market change. Not that those things are irrelevant, but I find mm -hmm. most of the true failures that that happen happen because team culture conflict between board or among board members or between board mm -hmm. members and entrepreneurs, co-founder issues. It's mm -hmm. all of these quote soft issues I find end up creating most of the, the, the things that break up companies tend to be the soft issues, not the hard issues. And no one focuses on them. No, exactly. And you know, we always want to talk about our successes. I have another question. It says so we make our entrepreneurs talk about their their vulnerabilities and talk about things that did not go well. And I, yeah. you know, I had I had a 
a rough kind of split with my co-founder. I had I had splits with part of my board. You know, you know, I've I've lived through these things too. And I think being able to mm -hmm. talk about them and share, I think is something that entrepreneurs don't do. And the, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, we, we've had a number of entrepreneurs talk about the connection between mental health and entrepreneurship. And I think we think of Absolutely. entrepreneurs as these strong gods who are always innovating, always positive, right? And, and I think that there's a, a mental health aspect of, of entrepreneurship. We've all learned about mental health throughout the, the COVID crisis. And I think we have to encourage people even more to really share. It's not just about failures as in Silicon Valley. Oh yeah, I failed, give me my term sheet, right? It's about <laughs> what mistakes did I make? Where did I go wrong and flaw? And what can I learn to do better? And, and, and entrepreneurs are almost never asked to have that introspection. Well, for sure, and, and there's that whole Brene Brown shame, you know, piece that comes with it, which is, do I wanna talk about it or do I wanna hide it underneath the rug? So we, we just got a question that's right along the same lines, but it says mistakes are given in startups. Absolutely. What are your two biggest learning events or losses and how did you recover? Well, one of the things that happened is that we were pretty successful at replicating an, an, an endeavor in first throughout Latin America, and then we went to the Middle East and, um, and South Africa, as I said, we're now in 40 markets. Um, but we had always been pulled in by the local business sector. And we always said our thesis was we've got to be pulled in, don't push. And remember, Endeavor has the nonprofit angle that comes to build ecosystems, find entrepreneurs, and then we have the for-profit, the funds that hopefully that will make the nonprofit self-sustaining and also give returns to LPs. Um, we decided this was back when the late Jim Wolfenson, who had been former head of the World Bank and ran private equity beforehand, said to us, Okay, you decided not to be in China, you have to be in India. Why am I part of this emerging markets group? If you're not in India, you got to go to India. We're going to India. So we came <laughs> in and said, okay, India, we are here. And people are like, uh, I don't know, we have, a, we have a bunch of Silicon Valley firms that are kind of interested. Uh, we have a bunch of, and we're like, no, 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 really, Endeavor, you need Endeavor, which we'd never done before. We'd always been people pulling in, no, I, I want to find the next entrepreneur. And, and it didn't work. And so we had to pull out. And so I think the lesson was one of our core values had been be pulled, don't push, right? And, and so um, I think that was the big lesson is that don't deviate from the model and the values that work, because if you, if you do, then, um, then it might work once, but it's, 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 it's not going to be sustainable. Um, I think the other thing was on the personal level, as I said, I had to, um, uh, you know, I had challenges with, well, with what was right for the next phase of the company. And I had this wonderful president who had been head of Endeavor in Mexico um, and every managing director wanted to know what he thought because Fernando was brilliant and would always tell me what was wrong. So I said, why don't, why don't we make this official and you become the COO? And he said, well, I'm not gonna be COO, CEO, I'll be president. I said, okay, you can be president. Um, <laughs> And, and he did everything right and he built processes and he took us from this, you know, scrappy startup to a, to a, a, a world class organization. But I sort of started feeling like, okay, it's now, this was um, in, in 2018, this is now 20 years in, if I'm going to stay, then we kind of need new energy and new ideas for this next phase. And there had been another managing director from Spain, Adrian Garcia Aranos, and I said, you know what, I really feel like Adrian kind of has what we need for the for the next level and I was terrified and I had to but I'm, I don't have a poker face so I had to tell the the minute I was thinking of it and I figured it was be 18 months later but I was gonna be so honest I took Fernando to dinner and I said okay I'm thinking about this but not for like 18 months His reaction was super interesting he said first of all Linda um he said I'm I'm, I'm shocked <laughs> I was not expecting this I'm like I know but he said but if there's one person it would make me proud to turn over to, it would be Adrian. Oh, he returned that's with great. Amazing. What does that say about him? He's an amazing person. And he says, I have two requests. One is I want to be the person to call Adrian to, to pass the baton. Mm -hmm. And he said, the other thing is I'm giving you three months. I will not be a lame duck. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. What did I do? But it, <laughs> right. And I, I am so grateful for him and respect him so much. 
Um, but that was my most, that was a really difficult moment. Um, and it was just thanks to the great people I had that that he made it easier for me, even though it was really personally very difficult. Oh, wow. That, I, this is the first time I've heard that story. So thank you. All right. Another question. What are the two to three red flags for not choosing a company to partner with? Good yeah, question. Good question. Um, super interesting. A lot of it is if you're a one man or one woman show, we have um, these selection panels that are the, uh, that are these international selection panels. You have to have unanimity, even if you've come through your local process, right? You have to go have unanimity, and you're being judged to get um, with other candidates, but really held to the same standards. And it's super interesting. We watch the dynamics of, of speaking of co-founders or partners, and if there's somebody who's dominating and someone who seems like they have no you know authority they're being jumped it gives us pause so i think a lot of it is that um that team dynamics the other thing is we love people who are confident but if you're arrogant to the point that you won't take any feedback it's impossible mm. to mentor someone who thinks they have all the answers and will not listen so i think those are the two red flags as if it's kind of that one man one woman show or there are weird partner dynamics and then the other is if um, you know, if you're just not going to listen at all, what I would say is because we will help. If if you're confused about B two B or B two C, we can help you with those strategic right challenges. Mm -hmm. None of those worry us, but those are the two, which is really interesting. It's back to that kind of interpersonal and and leadership qualities. Yeah, so it's human. It's about the humans human. that are, and it doesn't mean that one's right or wrong. It's just that interaction. I think right that you're talking about. Easy. All right. We have a, a question from Kenneth Sagendorf. I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right. Sorry, Kenneth. Um, so thank you, thank you, Linda and Sandy, for all your thoughts. I work at a university helping support entrepreneurs in early stages where we are developing their comfort with being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. This is especially important for underrepresented entrepreneurs. How could those of us working in the extreme early stages best deliver endeavor your next batch of investable companies and investable entrepreneurs? Great I, question, I Kenneth. Um, first of all, help them to think big. They have to think big, right? I think mean, when you ask, when you pull endeavor entrepreneurs, and we've invested, you know, $200 million in these companies, they still say the thing we did most for them is help them think big, right? So I think that that's <laughs> So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is I think that find whether it's endeavor entrepreneurs or other role models that seem aspirational but accessible to them, especially you know if they if 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 there are you know um, black brown Latin female founders that they that have gone big and have them come and talk mm -hmm. to your entrepreneurs. So they say it's back to that what I was saying with that Wences, if he can do it, if she can do it, I can too. I think we underestimate the role model effect and having people who are either one step or 10 steps ahead of you, but who you can relate to. I think there's nothing, there's nothing more powerful than that. Love that answer. And it is, it is hard when you, when you're growing up without those mentors to believe that it's possible. And you know, the mentors we have here in Colorado, the folks on the Endeavor board are so spectacular. Amazing. Amazing. Every time I meet them, like, from Nigeria and Indonesia and Colombia that ask for our Colorado, uh, you know, board members now as mentors. It's amazing. Yeah, oh, so <laughs> great. And the focus on ESG from those entrepreneurs is amazing as well. It's not just about investing. It's about that impact. So thank you for fostering that. Um, I have another just a quick shout out. This is amazing. Awesome. Your wisdom and input is greatly appreciated. So thank you, anonymous attendee. Uh, at 1247. Yeah. Right. If um, we, but, so no question right now, so I'm gonna ask the hard one. How, if you think that you're ready for Endeavor, what's the first, second, third step? What do you do to, to become part of the Endeavor family? Yeah, well, uh, Scott Miller is our wonderful managing director in in Denver. We have twelve offices in the in the U.S. and if uh, and then we're in thirty two countries. If you're not, and by the way, the CEO of Cameo is an Endeavor entrepreneur. He's living now in Miami, but he came through Endeavor Greece because he's Greek, which is awesome. <laughs> so if you're dual national, you can go through one of our countries. We have an expat <laughs> policy. It's fabulous. Um, <laughs> 
And you go through and you meet incredible people uh, through our local, our first and second opinion reviews. You eventually go through a local selection process. And then if you're lucky enough, I'll see you at the international selection process. <laughs> but what I, what I would say is, and we have scale up programs in a number, which is for the pre endeavor uh, selection of people need some more time, you know, to get advice, get mentorship before they're really ready to hockey stick grow. We mm -hmm. have scale up programs uh, as well. We also, you know, work out on our board are the, the founders of Techstars. We, you know, we love groups like Techstars and 500 Startups and um, Y Combinator, though I wish Y Combinator didn't take 7% equity. <laughs> story <laughs> but but i think there are now incubators and accelerators that can help with that earliest stage the product market fit and the early issues and then the scale up challenges really are are, are different absolutely and i i know you work you we work with a lot of partners so what i see scott doing is you know what you're not a great fit for what we're looking for but let me introduce you to seven other people yeah. so it's exactly. he's actually he's such a gem so if any of you want to reach out to Scott and you're interested, just know he's not going to say, oh, you're too small, go away. He's going to say, here's some other resources. So that's amazing. I love that. That is so true. <laughs> Linda, what question do you wish that someone would ask you? Oh my goodness. <laughs> now Sorry. you stumped me. Why <laughs> do I love Sandy Mays so much? And <laughs> Because I, when I joined the board of Zao, before it went public, I was introduced by my friend Melody Hobson to a Dan Caruso, the brilliant Dan Caruso. And, uh, and he was smart enough to introduce me early on to Sandy. And it was this, you know, Zao is this fiber, telecom, although it's tech, it's really cool, but people didn't understand, Linda, what are you doing in dark fiber? And Sandy shows me this incredible, incredible technology she's built that's going to give sales reps selling, you know, fiber optic cables, right, to, and she goes, no, 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 this is like selling shoes on Zappos, and do you want to see my, <laughs> uh, my website, and, and it was, and your passion, your energy, your engineering team, your net promoter score with your engineering team, Sandy, <laughs> was was such an inspiration it was among the reasons that i joined uh the board of zao and why i was so proud to be part of that and i love that it's come full circle that you've just joined our <laughs> board at endeavor colorado but i just that's that's the question uh that i wanted to answer now that's that's amazing and the feedback i'll give you is such a pleasure having you on the board i mean what i'll tell all of you is and this is amazing is linda would stop and say, Sandy, what do you think? And I'll tell you what, when you're in a high tech organization with almost all men and you have a woman on the board that says, what do you think? And pauses and gives you an opportunity to speak. I, I will be eternally grateful to you for that, Linda. That's, that's you're just crazy uh, influence on my life. Um, oh, is there an Endeavor website? Oh yeah. Yes. Well, not a, okay. The www.endeavor.org, but right now it is a holding. So listen, we are uh, re-unveiling and in advance of our 25th anniversary. So go now, endeavor.org. No, you spelled the American way, E-N-D-E-A-V-O-R. Mm -hmm. But in a month, check back because we will have <laughs> the new website under uh, you know relaunched. Yeah. Very, I didn't, that great question. And thanks for looking it up. That's amazing. All right, we have seven minutes left. Yeah, Anyone else have any questions? Compliment is the book if you want to, uh, which I wrote for people who weren't, weren't necessarily Endeavor entrepreneurs, who were just whether they were entrepreneurs or thinking of starting something or, uh, or high growth entrepreneurs like the Endeavor or social entrepreneurs. I, I wanted something where mm -hmm. I could t apply the lessons from Endeavor to people who you know were starting or thinking of starting in a variety of different um, circumstances. So that's crazy as a compliment. Now, I love that book. Well, actually, you, you just said why or who you wrote it for, which is good, understanding the customer, but why did you write it? Were people calling you crazy at some point? Oh, well, yeah, you said she could look. I mean, the idea, well, this is the, the last story. This is softball. Well, this is the softball. This is the, the story, <laughs> the origin story. So we had to raise money 
Okay. And my, my co-founder and I, and we wanted to raise it in market. So I wanted to raise it in Argentina. And I found out about this guy named Eduardo Elstein, who was at that point, the largest had made George Soros, the largest landowner in Argentina. He was a real estate entrepreneur and he was an Orthodox Jew. So I got 10 minutes on a Friday that was not going to go longer because he was leaving for Shabbat. <laughs> So it was 10 minutes, <laughs> and five minutes into the meeting, he turns to me and says, okay, I get it. You want uh, an intro to George Soros, my partner, I'll see what I can do. And I look at him and I said, no, Eduardo, I want your time. I'm an entrepreneur. We're, this is about supporting entrepreneurs in Argentina. I want your time, your passion and $200,000. And at this point he turns to his right-hand guy and he goes, esta chica esta loca. You know, <laughs> Not only is she crazy, but it's like you're in a bad movie where you go to take a shower and she's coming at you with the knife. So I said, you know, you know, I'm I'm disappointed. This from the guy who famously walked into George Soros's office and came out with a twenty million dollar check. You're lucky I only asked you for two hundred thousand. <laughs> and he leaves the room, and I'm like, oh my god, I've just been kicked out. I'm mortified. What am I going to do? The guy off scars looking at me like I don't know, and I'm I'm like getting up to leave and Eduardo walks back in with his checkbook and writes the check on the spot. And to this day says it's the best investment to date. But anyway, that's the that's the origin of Chica Loca. <laughs> love, love that story. Love you, Linda. Um, if anyone has any other questions, let us know. It's so grateful to you for taking time with us today. I know you just got back from Greece and you're probably time zone adjusting a little bit, but Look, and it's and, and let me just say about Denver and Boulder, what I've been blown away by is you mentioned our great board, which has phenomenal, you know, business leaders, uh, entrepreneurs, executives on it and four women, woohoo, which is awesome. Cool. <laughs> but what is what is incredible is that ethos of paying it forward and the spirit of not only building world class companies out of, uh, you know, the front range but also paying it forward and being so active to take the knowledge, take the resources and pour back into the community. Um, I, I feel so connected to, to that place. I am rooting for the success. Um, I know every day more folks from the coasts, you know, come in and, and I'm, I'm really excited about keeping what is pure about the, the Colorado spirit, even as we get these influx of, of, of folks from the coast. And it's been just a pleasure to be a, a teeny, teeny part of the ecosystem. That's an understatement. You're a huge part of our ecosystem. Your presence is always felt every board meeting, the passion on impact, not just impact in the company, but impact in the wider community is huge. And Linda, I can't believe you founded this in 1997 because you must have been two years old when that happened. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it's still going strong and it's growing and getting better and better every year. So thank you so much. Thanks to all of our attendees. Um, if you have any questions or anything, just you can ping us. I'm always open to LinkedIn connections. I know Linda is too. Link in with us, ask us questions. And uh, thanks. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. <laughs>